says, I'll still bless you in the middle of the storm, in the middle of my trial. I'll still bless you in the middle of the road when I don't know where to go. I'll still bless you in the middle of my storm, in the middle of my trial. Good morning, Living Springs. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He has risen. In Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. Would you rise in body and spirit so we can worship the Lord today?
dancing shoes on because we are getting ready to sing I Thank God. Amen? Amen. We are celebration church right after the liturgy. We're going to sing I Thank God. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Please say it with me. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope. He has raised Jesus from the dead. God has claimed us as his own. He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us light to the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Yeah. 
special about thinking about what the Lord has done for each one of us. People say, well, it's not really personal. And then you say, well, it really is. He came for me. Touch yourself and say, he came for me. And he also came for us. Amen. Remember that while we're singing this song. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You thought I was worth saving. You thought every one of us here today is worth saving. Our name was on your heart, Lord Jesus. When you went to that cross, Friday you gave your life, and today you rose and you showed up that death has no dominion over us. It has no dominion over us. We are free because of you, Jesus, because of you, the freedom you gave us. So, Lord Jesus, let our words not be silent when we worship you this day. Let us not be shy in what we want to say to you in gratitude and love and thanksgiving. Lord Jesus, we thank you because we are nothing without you, Lord Jesus. We are nothing. Lord Jesus, I pray for those who do not know you, Lord. Lord Jesus, bring people around them, bring us around them to bring them to know you, Lord Jesus, so they can know the joy that you have blessed us with, the salvation 
that you have freely given us, not because we deserved it, but because of your mercy, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Let it be a blessing this day and show that same mercy and that same grace and that same love on the lives of others, Lord Jesus, who don't know you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done, not because you had to, but because you loved us so much, Lord Jesus. Romans 6 says, Romans 6, 9 says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. If we didn't know before, we definitely know now. So thank you, Jesus. And thank you for the word, Lord. For when we have doubt, for when we have no, no understanding, let us go to your word, Lord Jesus. So we can be reminded over and over and over again just who you are, our Savior. So we celebrate you this day, Lord Jesus. We celebrate you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And amen. 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 Good morning, good morning, good morning. I welcome you now to say greet each other with the love of peace. Good morning and welcome to Living Springs Community Church. We are so glad that you joined us in worship this morning. Please take a moment and fill out the connection cards located on the seats around you. Please fill them out with your name and information, as well as any prayer requests or praise reports you have and drop them in this morning's offering plate. If you are new here, we would like to ask you to take the card instead to the Welcome Center in the lobby where we will have a gift waiting for you just to say thank you for joining us in worship today. On Monday, April 1st, we are hosting a Strictly Self-Defense for Seniors. During this class, you will build your self-confidence by learning prevention strategies and simple, effective strikes and escapes. Those who are differently abled and use walking aids are more than welcome to attend. The cost of the training is $12, and you can sign up by calling our church office or speaking to Pastor Robin. Did you know our Living Springs Gardens are cared for by the Grateful Gardeners, a ministry led by Miss Gloria Gardner? On April 6th, our gardening team needs your help to clean up the garden beds around Living Springs to get them ready for planting. Please consider signing up to volunteer on Saturday, April 6th from 8 to 11 a.m. If possible, please bring a shovel and some pruning shears. Please email Miss Gloria if you plan on helping out. Do you have an interest in card making or a passion for reaching sick or shut in church members through cards? Mrs. Hardashi Carter will be leading our new card ministry. This group will meet once per month on a Friday. The first gathering date is Friday, April 19th. If you are interested in signing up, please email Mrs. Carter at OTS28 at Comcast.net. 
Vacation Bible School is coming on June 17th through 21st for kids in preschool through fifth grade. Registration opens on May 1st for students, but we are building our team of volunteers right now. This is a huge outreach opportunity as we welcome kids from our community for games, music, crafts, Bible stories, and more. Living Springs Adults and Teens, can you serve? Volunteer registration is now open on our website, or you can talk to Kristen Verver about joining our amazing team for the best week of the summer. Good, evil, truth, lies. We are engaged in an epic battle between two spiritual kingdoms for the hearts and minds of our youth. Every day our kids are bombarded with lies about who they are, who their creator is, what is right and where their salvation comes from. But we are not meant to fight this battle alone. God, the ruler of the good kingdom, has given his kingdom keepers spiritual armor to wear. With this VBS, your kids will learn how they can be a part of God's kingdom through salvation in his son, and they will be equipped with the armor of God as they train to become keepers of the kingdom who stand strong in today's battle for truth. Huzzah! This time, we'd like to invite the ushers up front. Let's pray over the offerings. Lord Jesus, we have because you bless us. We work because you bless us. We are free to give back because you bless us. So, Lord, Heavenly Father, touch our hearts to give freely this day, not out of obligation, but because we love you so much and we want to give back what you have blessed us with. Help us, Lord, to not give begrudgingly or think we have to, Lord, but because, Lord Jesus, you are the provider of all, Lord Jesus. You are the reason that we walk in our blessings. So I ask you, Lord, to bless today's offering. I ask you, Lord, to, to bless the hands that will put forth these offerings towards your purpose, Lord. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that we are able to give today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Out of the shadows, bound for the gallows, a dead man walking, to love came calling. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, six feet.
was too far gone. Amen. Good morning. Okay. I was trying to recruit an assistant pastor, but he told me he had another job, so he didn't want to come. So, all right. Happy Resurrection Day. Wow, y'all don't sound too happy about that. Y'all happy about it? Yeah. Amen. Yeah, give the Lord a hand, praise. Amen. Help. Armin, I need some of your energy. Help him out. Yes, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. There you go. There you go. All right. So glad that each of you are here. Thank you for being here to worship with us today. Also, so glad that um, those of you who are watching with us online. Um, praise the Lord, and I pray that God will prepare your hearts and minds for whatever it is he wants to give you. A couple of things I want to mention before we're about to do um, new member installation, um, but um, before that, I want to ask you to do something, if you can. I know you're not going to like this, but you know what? We always have, we're going to have people that's going to come in a little bit later, and it's always embarrassing for them they have to like, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and like try to get to the middle or like make them do the, the walk of shame, come all the way to the front row. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's why y'all got here early, didn't it? So y'all didn't have to do that walk of shame. Okay. So if you could, uh, if you are on the ends, if y'all could scoot into the middle a little bit, we'd appreciate that. That way um, the people come in, it's easier for them um, to find a seat. Okay. Thank you for your um, thoughtfulness in doing that. The other thing I want to mention to you, again, to remind you, um, please silence your phones. If you have your phones, I know God is probably calling you, but um, put God on hold, on your, at least on call. Put him on uh, call waiting, and uh, please silence your phones. Today, we are um, doing new member installation. Uh, we've had four people who have gone through our latest um, class, and uh, we want to invite them up and just so you can recognize those people. So uh, Ryan Mitchell and Rosemary West and Kennedy Curtis and Craig Ms. West. I think, I think Ms. Rose, come on up. There you go. Got one, two, I think a couple of people uh, could, oh, we got three of them here. Okay. All right. Come on up. Y'all can stand right here so everybody can see you. Yeah, come on right up here. Yep. And they are preaching today. Hallelujah. Yeah, see, look at he looked like he looked like a preacher, don't he? So there you go. So Kennedy told me she was very excited about bringing the word today. So that's why she's about to pass out. All right. So we just have two questions for you. Now bring them up here um, before you not to embarrass them but so that you will know that they are part of the body. We are the body of Christ, and we just added some new members to the family. We want you to know. So please see them. Yes, there you go. Welcome. There you go. You can welcome them. It's good. There you go. I just have two simple questions for you. Um, one, do you believe that in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, do you believe in the death, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And have you submitted to him as the Lord? If so, please say, I have. And are you willing to submit to the leadership of this church and commit to the supporting of its mission and vision through the giving of your time, talent, and treasure? I will. Amen. So God bless you. Welcome to Living Springs family. Amen. So you see them uh, outside, please greet them, let them welcome them to the family. Amen? Amen. Y'all can hear. Welcome. All right. Welcome. Welcome. All right. Y'all can be seated. Unless y'all want to preach. No? Okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, in case you were wondering, um, our next classes are going to be held on Wednesday, April 24th, and Wednesday, May 1st at uh, 6 o'clock. Second floor, room 220. Just go to the second floor and yell. We'll find you, okay? But uh, yeah, room, uh, room 220, second floor. If you are interested in that, if, you would, uh, if you're interested in membership, 
please fill out one of those cards, put your name on there, and we'll make sure we will call you and remind you. Amen? Amen. I think that's all of the announcements. Let me see. That's all of my announcements. Good. All right. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for the privilege of knowing you, the privilege of serving you. Thankful for this resurrection day. Lord, it's a beautiful day physically, but Lord, it is a beautiful day spiritually because it reminds us what you have done for us so that we can have relationship with you. I thank you for each person that is here, each person that has made the effort to come into your house today. Lord, I pray that you would transform this place, this space, uh, into the Damascus Road so that each person that comes in here would have the opportunity to have a genuine encounter with the risen Lord. I pray, Father God, that your spirit would be pleasant, present in this place. I pray, Lord God, that you would draw in our wandering minds and our scattering thoughts. Lord, we may be thinking about dinner. We may be thinking about the basketball game that's coming on. We may be thinking about grandma's food. We may be thinking about what is in the oven and whether we left, we turned the oven off. Our minds may be in many, many different places. But Lord God, I know that the most important place we can be right now is here in your presence, present in your presence. So draw in our wandering minds, our scattering thoughts, so that we could hear what it is that you want to give us this day. Speak to our hearts, Lord God, because your servants are listening. It's in the strong and the matchless name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. He is risen. He is risen he is. Okay, so my next question is what? So what? <laughs> If you walked into Aldi's right now and said to somebody, just walked over and said to them, walked up to a random person picking up a pomegranate and said, he is risen, and they would go, and? Who is he? <laughs> Who cares? So what? You ever thought about that? If we have been, if you have been around in church for a while, if you've been around for a while, you've been, as I mentioned last week, last week was my 64th Palm Sunday. This is my 64th Easter, at least. And so um, as I think about that, how many times have we heard that? He is risen. He is risen indeed. But, but who cares? <laughs> what difference does it make? Well, what difference does it make to you? What difference does it make to the person at the car, down at Udo's washing their car right now? Apparently it makes no difference to them. To the person who's at Walmart right now, what difference does it make? To the person who's at home who's been up all night cooking dinner, getting ready for their family to come, what difference does it make? Does it really matter at all that he is risen? What is the significance of that? I'm not sure if I'm gonna if I'm gonna bring this into the sermon later, but as we were praying, by the way, we pray at 9:40 on Sunday mornings. Would love to have you join us before service to come and pray with us. But as we were praying, it hit me really hard, this idea that Jesus conquered death. And what is the significance of that? He conquered death. I said to the students at the school on Wednesday, uh, we talk about the fact that someone died for us. We say that so often that it becomes passe, oh yeah, they died. I, I think we, we, we forget the significance of someone dying, but I think we also significant, we forget the significance of the fact that he conquered death. What's in my heart, it may come, it, it, I may bring it out later. I just wanted to, I want you to stop and think about that idea. That there's a significance that he conquered death. And so the scripture that I want to look at today Familiar scripture, and I pray that God gives you something new and something fresh out of it. And it is from Matthew chapter 28. We're going to be looking at the first seven verses. If you are able, I would appreciate it if you would stand in honor of God's word. So Matthew, you have your Bibles, open them to Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 7. 
I am reading from the New Living Translation in case you were wondering. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. And the, the guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. The angel spoke to the women, don't be afraid, don't, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. Not where it is lying, where it was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his words. You may be seated. He is risen. What difference does it make? Three things I just want to point out to you in terms of the significance to you and me of Jesus' resurrection. The first thing about Jesus' resurrection is that it changes our perceptions. Again, look at verse 1. Early on Saturday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, isn't that terrible? That's your name for the rest of your life. You're the other Mary, you know. It's kind of funny. Um, when I first, my first day here, back in 2009, um, Carl uh, Boonder, Carl Boonder greeted me, introduced himself, and then a few minutes later, an older gentleman walked up to me, and he says, hi, I'm the other Carl, and it was Carl Stiver. And from this, so for the last 14 years, Carl has always been the other Carl. So it's just kind of interesting. So now we have the other Mary. So he says they came and they went out to visit the tomb. They did more than, they went out to do more than visit. They weren't just going out to, to look at the tombstone. They weren't just going out to look at the headstone. They were going out. Um, there was a specific reason that they were going out to the tomb. Last week on Palm Sunday, we learned, we, we saw, we heard this question. We learned that Jesus was the un-king. We talked about the un-cola. And the un-cola, when 7-Up came out, they, they called it the un-cola. Other words, it was not just like any other cola that you had expected. It was not dark. It was not strong. It was this clear, refreshing, something not made out of cola nuts, but made out of lemons and lime. It was the uncola. And we learned that Jesus was the un-king. He was not a king like anything anybody had expected. It. He did not come into the, uh, into the, the, the city um, talking about how great he was, flexing his muscles, flexing his, his spiritual muscles and his power, did not come in on a big horse, came in humbly on a donkey. Uh, and so he came in, he was not expecting. And as he did that, people were asking the question, who is this person? Who is this person? And now, but then they rejected him because he did not act like the king that they wanted him to act like, so they rejected him. A week later, on Easter morning, uh, we see something different. In the aftermath of Jesus' death, we don't see people who are um, disillusioned, but we see people who are disappointed. The now you see his followers are still asking this question. These, these people, these followers who had given their life to him, maybe some of them for as many as three years, they're still asking the question, who is this? We thought he was, but he's dead. We thought he was the Messiah, but he's dead. We thought he was the king, but he's dead. And instead of throwing down their robes and the palms, they came with spices <laughs> to, to prepare his body. They came to anoint the body 
of somebody who was dead, and they came trying, figuring out how do we live life without him because he's gone. They came expecting to find a dead Jesus. They came expecting to find a body whose body needed preserving. They came expecting to care for Jesus. In one of the other scriptures, I think it's in Luke, it says that where, they were all they were upset. They says, where, where have you taken his body? We need to take care of Jesus. He is weak. We need to take care of him. Somebody else has moved him. He has no power. They came expecting a Jesus who needed to be put to rest. Some of you have had funerals. And I think about the funerals that I go to and what do we do? We put the person to rest. We put their body in the grave and then we close the case, all of those things and we put them to rest and then life goes on. They basically had a funeral for Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is done. His time on earth, yes, we have lovely memories of him, but he no longer is going to daily impact our lives. What about his disciples? What, what about the people that he had given his life to for 12 years? They were all huddled up in the house wondering, are we next? They were scared men wondering, were they, were they going to be the next ones to die? What, what does this tell me? What should it tell you about your faith? What should this tell you about his followers and therefore by extended, uh, extension us? It indicates to me that they didn't believe what he told them. He had been telling them what? I'm going to rise. I'm going to rise. Three days. For he, had, he had told them for a long time, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to go into Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. But then on the third day, I'm going to get up. He had said that to them time and time again. But they did not grasp the significance of what he was saying. They didn't grasp the significance of his promises. What that tells me is that they had not internalized the truth. They had not internalized the word or his teaching. I was talking to a student this week who was struggling with identity, struggling with, matter of fact, with, with words. She kept saying to me, I'm not enough. I'm not enough. I don't have value. I said, where does value come from? And then she looked me in the eyes and she said, it comes from Jesus. I said, that's a great answer, but do you believe that? And she says, yeah, I do believe it. I believe value comes from Jesus. She says, but the world tells me my value comes from how I look and it comes from what people say about me. And the world says that my value comes from looking perfect and sounding perfect. I said, so we have this juxtaposition between what Jesus says gives you value and what the world says gives you value. She says, yeah. I said, so why you believe in the world rather than Jesus? If Jesus says it, but then you, says, you said the world tells you something different and you're living according to what the world says and your value is based upon the world says, what the world says, you're telling me that Jesus' word has no impact upon your life. You can tell me what it says, but you do not allow it to change what you do. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? You can tell me the words, but you do not allow the words to change how you live. What that tells me is that you have not internalized the word of God. And you have not internalized that what I mean by that is that if Jesus has, does not have the, if Jesus does not have the power to do what he said he could do, if Jesus' word cannot change your life, he is a liar, he is weak, and why in the world would you possibly follow him? <laughs> why would you follow a God who you can control? Why would you follow a God who can be killed and moved and somebody else has to come and to prepare his body? Why would you prepare a God 
whom you are stronger than? Why would you follow a God who you are stronger than? And why would you listen to a God who cannot keep his word? See, that's the challenge. It challenges our perceptions. So these people came to Jesus and they said, man, it was fun while it, was last, while it lasted. Man, y'all remember the time when he turned the tables over? Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that time when, when he healed that guy? And, and, and you remember that time? And you remember that time? Yeah, that was great. Okay, what's for dinner? Hmm. You remember that time, but it doesn't impact my life. See, what's your perception of Jesus? What did you come today expecting to see? <laughs> Where are you, who, who are you looking for and where are you looking? <coughs> Excuse me. Where are you looking? Are you looking for a Jesus who will make you rich? Are you looking for a Jesus who will take away all of your problems? Are you looking for a Jesus who will make you healthy and wealthy and wise? Who are you looking for and where are you looking? Are you looking in your bank account? You're looking in your house. Where are you looking? Who are you looking for and where are you looking? You see, and so this is significant. So they came looking for a dead Jesus that they could control, and they got the shock of their life. Because, you see, Jesus' resurrection also reveals his power. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down and rolled aside the stone and sat on it. I want you to remember that phrase right there. He rolled aside the stone and he sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Tough guys. Then the angel spoke to the woman, to the women, don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Just as he said what happened. So don't you remember his teaching? He told you. He told you. He said, just as he said what happened, come see where his body was lying. Look at these phrases. One he said, he is not here. He isn't here. See, your perception, very often you all, again, as I just mentioned, where are you looking? Who are you looking for? Where, why are you looking for him in that particular place? What do you want Jesus to do for you? Where you are looking tells me what you want him to do for you. Okay? And so we look at this, our perception of Jesus is very often is the wrong place. We think of him as a prophet, as a teacher. Good friend, martyred revolutionary, wonderful teacher, but is he Lord? <laughs> See, when he's Lord, he's more than just, oh, yeah, I, that, that's nice. You know, if, if my children looked at me and says, yes, you're, when they were little, yes, you're daddy, and I tell them to do something, they go, man, you better get out of my face. That's a problem with that, wouldn't it? There would be a little bit of a problem with that. If my children would tell me, you have no right to tell me what to do in my house. I remember I used to, when Jerron, I used to tell Jerron to clean his room. And Jerron would tell me that, you, are, you know what, daddy is my room. And I was like, oh, no, no, come here. Say, come here, let's talk. Let, let's have a little conversation. And repeat after daddy, I own nothing. <laughs> Repeat after me, I own nothing. You see, and I would tell him, no, you don't pay the mortgage here. You are living rent-free in our house. You don't get to tell me how you operate in my house. God says, how can you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you to do? It does not work. There is some, something is wrong with that picture. 
He said he is in here. What's your perception of Jesus? What are you looking for? What do you expect him to do for you? What are you looking for? The second thing he said, he's risen. He is risen from the dead. See, he is much more than our earthly perception of Jesus. He said, Jesus says, listen, I don't need your sympathy. <laughs> I don't need your care. I don't need your protection. I don't need your assistance. I want you to stop and think about the fact that these women went, and again, the women went, the men were hiding. All of them were scared. All of them had this idea that their friend, their Lord, their, their Savior, their Messiah was no longer in control, and he, they needed to control him. Do you operate that way in your relationship with Christ? Do you, do you demand that he, does, that he does what you tell him to do? <laughs> do you pray with that understanding that I tell Jesus what to do? I think I, I posted something the last couple of days where I talked about the fact that we must get over the arrogant mindset that Jesus, we, we tell Jesus what to do rather than him telling us what to do. <laughs> How do you respond? Are you angry with him because he's not operating the way you want him to operate? I want you to notice something else that I, that I thought was, that I found interested in this scripture. Let's see if I can find it for you. It says here, that the angels came down and they rolled aside the stone, right? See that? They rolled aside the stone and they sat on it. Now, stop and think about growing up. What is your idea? What is the picture that you get when you think of the angels coming down rolling away the stone? Think of, just think, get that picture in your head. And I realized this week that I always thought of the fact that the angels rolled away the stone to let Jesus out. You ever thought about that? Is that what you thought? Is that, is that kind of your image? I don't know. But it said he, they rolled aside the stone, and then he told them, come look. Come look at what? An empty tomb. So I think my image has always been the angels came down, they rolled away the stone, Jesus left, the women came, right? And they looked inside the tomb, and Jesus wasn't there. Does that make sense? That's the picture. I ain't going to lie to you. That may, maybe you all were more spiritual than me. That was the picture I had in my head. They rolled away the stone, Jesus came out, they came and looked, he is not here. The reality is this. They rolled away the stone. Jesus was already gone. <laughs> he was already gone. Then you get this picture of Jesus sitting inside the tomb. Sitting in there. Man, they, they told me 11. It's 11.02. They're late. They're late for a very important date. <laughs> do, do you get this picture of Jesus sitting there biting his nails, patting his, you know, nervously waiting, listening? What was that? What, what was that? Was that the sound of it? Was it are, they, are they letting me out now? They opened the tomb. Jesus not only was gone, Jesus had done housekeeping, y'all. My, my wife and I were away a portion of this week, uh, Friday, Friday, Thursday, and, Thursday and Friday, and we stayed at a hotel. And at one point, the, 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 the housekeeping knocked on the door, housekeeping, and we told them, we're good, we don't need housekeeping. Because you know what, when you, if you come into a hotel behind us, the hotel looks better than it did when it came in there. I don't leave the hotel room a mess. I don't leave the hotel, because we come in, we make up the bed, we put away all of the garbage, we do all the stuff like that. 
Jesus is simply saying, Jesus came in, said, I don't need any housekeeping, y'all. I don't need you to come in and turn down the sheets. I don't need you to come in and put some mints on my pillow because I'm not even here. Look, the, t- the, 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 the death clothes are already folded. He says, I am not even here. That's where I want you to get you all. The stone was rolled away not to set Jesus free from his imprisonment, but to release the followers from their inaccurate and impotent perceptions of who he was. (laughs) Do y'all hear that? You need to understand that Jesus does not need us. We need him. Jesus is not under our control. He controls us. Jesus does not need us to fight for him. He fights for himself. Can you you remember when Peter was in the garden and they came to arrest Jesus and Peter pulled out the sword and was like started hacking out, trying to hack off people's heads. And Jesus was like, okay, Peter, chill, baby. I got this. And he picks up, goes down, and he puts the guy's ears back on. He says, that's not the way I roll. That's not the way I fight. I don't need you to fight for me. On the cross, he says, don't you know that if I wanted to, I could call down legions of angels from heaven? Don't you know that he says, I did not give, nobody took my life from me. I laid down my life. I laid it down. Why? Because I have the power to pick it back up. So you need to know the Jesus that we're talking about. We're not talking about some weep, wimpy Jesus. Some Jesus that you can, you can control him any way you want to. I was teaching in India, and they told me, and, and you know, you don't, you, people don't realize this, because probably most of the people from India that you have met are strong Christians. That's not the reality in that country. The reality in that country is that a very, very, very small percentage of the country, probably under 10 percent, are Christian. Most of it is Hindu. And so I remember as I was teaching there and this guy told me, he says, be careful if you're talking to Hindu people. He says, because the way you teach, he says, you will become a God to them. Because they have Hundreds and hundreds of God. Why? Because they're looking for someone to give meaning to their life. They're looking for some way to explain why life is what it is. So they're constantly looking for gods. The problem is that they are creating gods that they are creating. If you can create a God, you can kill a God. (laughs) If you can set up a God, you can tear down a God. I don't want a God that I can forget about it because I left him in the closet in the basement. How powerful is a God who can be controlled by the one he is supposed to be protecting? Who is your Jesus? Do you understand his power? I need you to understand that Jesus is not diminished by our blindness. He's not silenced by by death. He's not diminished by our unbelief. He is not discredited by any level of deception. You remember what happened with 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 the, um, the guards? The guards fainted. When they woke up, they went to their bosses and said, he's not here, he's gone. They said, well, listen, we can't let nobody believe that. So I need you to make up a story. And here's your story. And they fought, they created a story, and they said many people believe that story still. You talk to people today, the people today will still tell you it's all a hoax. Isn't it amazing? If Jesus is a hoax, it is the best hoax in the history of the world. If Jesus is a hoax, if he is a lie, it is the best most well articulated, carried out for thousands of years, that means our entire dating system is based upon a hoax. (laughs) We literally count time on the basis of the life of this person. And you're going to tell me that's a hoax? That everybody in the world follows that? And they've all been hoodwinked, bamboozled? 
You see, we, he cannot be discredited by deception. He cannot be buried by our doubts. You say, I don't believe it. I don't understand it. So, years ago, I had a friend named Vivian. She was a librarian at the library where I used to, where I was at all the time. And she told me she did not follow Christ because she did not believe. It, it, the, um, it didn't make sense. The, all of Jesus and the Trinity and all that stuff, I didn't make any sense. I said, so you're telling me you don't follow Christ because you can't explain it. She said, yeah, functionally. I said, okay. I said, you just had a baby recently, didn't you? She said, yeah. And she pulled out her wallet to show me the baby, show me a picture of the baby. I said, your baby don't exist. She said, what are you talking about? And she asked when she pulled out the wallet. I said, as far as I know, that baby came with the wallet. <laughs> that, your baby don't exist. She said, my baby does exist. I said, no, it cannot. I said, can you explain to me how the egg and the sperm found each other? I said, can you explain to me, out of all of the thousands of eggs and the thousands of sperm, two of them managed to swim the tide, to, to, to swim the Nile of your reproductive system, and those two found each other. Can you explain that to me? She says, no. I said, can you explain to me how that egg and that sperm found each other in some kind of way came together and began to create some kind of a life form? No. Can you explain to me how that microscopic egg and that sperm came together and created bone that were knitted together in a perfect way? Can you explain to me? No. Can you explain to me how that egg and that sperm came together and they found and they were able, it was able to build a beating heart and operational lungs and a liver? Can you explain that to me? She says, I cannot. Can you explain to me how that kid knew what time it was to come? that they come out with a blackberry in their hand, that they have a little calendar to know six weeks, seven weeks, and they knew time to go. Can you explain that to me? She said, no. I said, then your kid doesn't exist. Because if the only way you believe stuff is on the basis of your capacity to understand it, then your child does not exist. God says, I am, God says that my ways are above your ways and my thoughts are above your thoughts. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so far my ways are above your ways and my thoughts are above your thoughts. Your belief, your understanding, your capacity, your eloquence does not make Jesus real. Jesus' birth, death. Res burial and resurrection is what makes Jesus real. He is real because he is the Lord before you were even a thought. <laughs> the scripture says in the beginning, not after the beginning started, not after the credits have rolled, in the beginning, God created. You ain't not even smarter than a fifth grader. How you gonna be smarter than God? God says, I am the Lord, and he is risen. The cross is empty. The tomb is empty. He is alive. He has conquered death. Now, let me just say this real quickly. I know my, my, I'm getting close to my time here. But he says, I conquered death. This is what hit me as I stood in the prayer room this morning. When, we, when Jesus, when God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of the fruit. He says, why? Because on the day that you eat of it, what will happen? You will surely die. Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. Don't say apple, the fruit. Doesn't say it was an apple. Okay, he, they ate of the fruit, and the moment they ate of the fruit, they took the first chomp. If God was telling the truth, they should have what? Killed over and died. They didn't. Was that not proof? that God was a liar. See, they didn't die. They say, see, I, that, I, 
I bet as soon as they ate it, the devil said, see, I told you. Because the devil didn't understand what God was doing. Adam and Eve did not understand what God was doing. What I need you to understand is that when God said, on the day that you eat it, you will surely die, he says, on the day that you eat it, your relation, your, your obedience, your disobedience, your will, your desire to do what you want rather than what I want, your desire to exalt yourself over what I want, on the day that you do that, you will put yourself, you will form a spiritual coup you will depose me as king, and you will put yourself in place as king. And the day that you do that, your relationship with me will be broken. That is death. What we need to understand is that death, we tend to think of death in corporeal terms, in physical terms, in terms of beating hearts and, and active brains. And so therefore, we think of everything in terms of physical. God says, I am what? Spirit. And therefore, God always speaks in terms of the spiritual things. So therefore, the most important thing is not your, the beating of your heart. It is the condition of your soul. And if he says, I have, so when, when they Adam and Eve sinned, they were immediately separated from God and would have been for eternity if but for the grace of God. But for the grace of God who came looking for them. They didn't go looking for God. The grace of God that says, I will cover your sin with the blue, by, by killing an animal and shedding their blood for you. The grace of God that clothed them in a new garment and said, come out from behind the tree of shame and be reclothed, get a new garment of the redemptive grace of God. It was God who came looking for them and said, I want you in relationship with me. That is the conquering of death. The conquering of death is not that you will live until you are 115. The conquering of death is that you will live forever in the presence of God if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. That is what we're excited about today. Listen, I am excited about living until I'm 115. The way my body is breaking down, Lord, have mercy, I don't want to be here at 115 years old. No, I don't want to be at 115. No, because to be absent from the, from the body is what? To be present with the Lord. And if I am present with the Lord, in his presence is what? The fullness of joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. If Oprah invites me to her 50,000 square foot house, and I'm in, I'm in my rat infested trailer, I'm not going to go... Uh, uh, I've been here for a while. I like this place. Nope. I'm going to run over her at the door. <laughs> I'm just going to run right over her. You see, do you understand? Last thing I want to say to you is this, you all. I want you to understand the power of Jesus. Jesus is alive. <laughs> he is not a dead God. He is not a God under your control. He is alive and he is powerful and he is able to make your life everything that he says I wanted to be in the first place. Adam and Eve sold us down the river. Adam and Eve sold us. And next thing we know, we are having pain and childbirth and creeping Charlie in the, in the yard and, and having to go and work jobs and breaking fingers. God says, I never intended all of that for you. I intended you to live in my presence and to simply grasp all of the goodness that I have for you. But when you chose to live in disobedience, you blew all of that. And Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the absolute full. I want you to understand the last thing is this is that Jesus says this, is that Jesus' resurrection defines our purpose. Why are you here? He says, what did he tell those women? He says, 
go and tell. He says, now go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and you will see him there. Remember what I have told you. I want you to think of what he says in Matthew 28. He told his disciples at the end of his, after his resurrection, before he went into heaven, he said to them, he told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them these new, teach these new disciples to obey all of the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The word there, go, is, means as you are going, as you are living your everyday life, as you are living your everyday life, changing diapers, being a crossing guard, changing, taking out the garbage, as you are living your everyday life as a doctor, as a lawyer, as a professor, as a factory worker, as a teacher, whatever your life may be, as a retired person, as you are living your everyday life, live in such a way that people see your life and go, I want that quality of life. If the quality of your life is not attracting people to you, it is not the quality of life that God has planned for you. Your life should be light that people say, I want that. There should be something about you that people say, I want that. I want that kind of joy. I want that kind of love. I want that kind of peace. I want that kind of patience. I want that kind of hope. But if your life is in this life alone, if your hope is in this life alone, you're going to be miserable. He says in Acts, he says, this is what will happen. He said this to his disciples. He says, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit that has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, at home, in Judea, in your neighborhood, in Samaria, in cross-cultural relationships, to the ends of the earth, in missions. He says, you will be my witnesses. You should look, people should look at you, and you should be able to tell a story of what you have seen and experienced. If you are, if you are telling a story about something that you have not seen, it's called a lie. <laughs> He says, you are to be my witnesses. He says, you are to be my witnesses. He tells us not to live as obnoxious bullies, <laughs> but as convinced witnesses. You need to be able to tell your story of a genuine encounter with the risen Savior who has changed your life. If you don't have that story to tell, what are you telling? I'm going to pick on him for a second. I'm looking at my friend Armin sitting over here. Armin got a story to tell. I, I, I remember when Armin came to Christ. <laughs> Armin, Armin was far away from God, but Armin had a genuine encounter in this place with the resurrected Savior. And as a result of that, Armin ain't got no problem of raising his hands and going, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Because there is a story to tell. He is not ashamed of telling his story because you might not like it. He is not ashamed of telling his story because you may be embarrassed. He is not ashamed of telling his story because it may not make sense to you. He says, I can't tell you why Jesus did this. I didn't go to seminary. I didn't go to school. I ain't been in church all my life. But I know this. Yesterday I was blind, but today I can see. God is not asking you to tell my story. God is not asking you to tell somebody else's story. He says, you need to be ready to tell your story of a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ. That's all you need to tell. You ain't got to preach like Peter and pray like Paul. You ain't got to be a leader like Moses. You need to be a convinced witness that has had a genuine experience with the living God who has said you were blind, but now you see. 
I was lost, but now I'm found. Your story will impact people. Listen, I am convinced of this. I am becoming more and more convinced that this is true of most of the people that I meet that have rejected faith in the church. Hear what I'm saying. Most of the people that I meet that have rejected faith in the church, they have not rejected Jesus because they ain't never met him. (laughs) They have not rejected Jesus because they have never met him. What they have met is the messiness of the messengers. (laughs) What they have seen is the caricature of Jesus rather than the character of Jesus. They have seen this picture that we have created that is hateful, that is divisive, that is misogynistic, that is intolerant, that is unloving, that cannot have a conversation. They have seen a picture of a Jesus that is judgmental. They have seen that picture and they go, I don't want him. I said, I don't want him either. I want the Jesus that I met in the Bible. I want the Jesus that saved me. I want want to show them the Jesus that changed my life. That's the Jesus I want you to meet. And listen, okay, I'm I'm sorry, y'all. Just give me a couple more minutes, y'all. You see, I'm going to say this, and I can say this in the context of this beautiful multicultural church. But if I based my faith upon the Jesus of my people, my past, my politics, my tribe, my experiences, my ideologies, if I allowed that to shape my faith based upon those three things, I would not be a Christian, and I would hate white people. That's the reality, y'all. That's the reality of my life, based upon my experiences alone. But I am so glad that my life is not based upon purely my people, my past, and my politics. And my life is based upon the genuine encounter that I had with the one who died to save me. And even though other folks took his word and did with his word what they should not do, I was able to see beyond that by the power of the Holy Spirit that lets me know that he is real even if they are lying. You see, folks, people are rejecting, not Jesus. I think they're rejecting the messiness of the people they've seen. I want you to know that Jesus is risen, and it's a big deal. Some of you, some of you have been his followers for years, but you have taken the power and the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ for granted. You're not living according to power. You're not not appropriating your appropriations. You're not living in the authority and the victory and the hope that is is yours in Christ Jesus. That should change today. Some of you are here today because you've allowed your disappointments and your disillusionment with the church. You've allowed your disappointment with God's people. You've even allowed your disappointment with God himself because he has not operated the exact way that you wanted him to operate, to bury your faith and to put your faith to rest. And as a result of that, you are just simply going through the motions, but your faith is not faith. It's just something that you control. That should change today. (laughs) Some of you, Like the guards in the tombs, you've been deceived. (laughs) You've bought the lies of the enemy who wants to tell you deep in your heart, this stuff ain't true. It's all a lie. That should change today. Just stand to your feet. You're here today and you don't know Christ. That can change today. (laughs) I'm not talking about the Christ that 
your Sunday school Jesus that told you some nice stories. I'm talking about the one that can change your life. The one that comes into the messiness of your life and makes sense of it. If you're here today and you don't know that Jesus, then I'm going to invite you to come to meet him today. I'm going to ask that some of our prayer ministers will come forward. And if you don't know him today, then I'm going to ask you to come up and talk with them. Tell them, you know what, I don't understand everything. I'm not even sure if I believe all of it, but I know enough to know that I want that Jesus that you're talking about. It, it, there's something in my spirit that tells me that I need to know him. And I just, I just need somebody to talk to me about that. If you're here today and you want to know that Jesus, then I'm going to invite you to come and let someone know. Let someone know. Um, let them know that you want to meet that Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you just need another commitment to the Lord. You are recognizing that you have allowed your disappointments and your disillusionment, your irritation with people. Folks, I understand church hurt. My goodness, I understand church hurt. My, my daddy was a preacher. My daddy was my pastor for 40 years and never told me. I understand church hurt. I, I understand being stood in front of the church and embarrassed. I understand church hurt. I understand rejection from people within the church. I understand church hurt, but I also understand God healing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh. Mm. Don't allow your disappointment with God's children to blind you to the truth of God the Father. Maybe some of you are here today and you have been bought, you've bought the lie that God is not real, that scripture ain't real, and the Bible was written by broken people. Yep, but it was dictated by a whole God. If you're here today and you want to know this Jesus we're talking about, I'm going to invite you to come. Let someone pray with you. Don't be shy. Jesus wasn't shy for you. But if God is speaking to your heart, I'm going to invite you today. Come. Father God, we are grateful. We're grateful for the power that we have in Christ Jesus. We're grateful for the relationship that we can have in Christ Jesus. And I pray, Father God, that your spirit would move in the hearts and the minds of your people. I pray, Lord God, right now that if we don't know you, if if someone doesn't know you, Lord God, that you would give them the courage to say yes to you today. If there is someone here today that, whose heart has been broken, whose mind has been deceived, someone here today who does not understand and does not know this Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would introduce yourself to them today, that they would say yes to you. Lord, I pray that you would break down walls of deception. Lord God, that you would bind the enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy, but that someone today would know that they can have life and have it abundantly. As you leave this place today, I pray that you would go in power, not your power, but in resurrection power. I pray that as you leave this place today that you would go knowing that Jesus Christ is not dead. He's alive. <laughs> that Jesus Christ is not on the cross. He was. He is not in the grave. He was. But today he is alive. Today he is alive and can be alive in your heart. And if you were dead, you can be alive too. I pray that as you leave this place today, you may leave changed. That you may leave with a new perception of Jesus. That you may leave with renewed power of Jesus. That you may leave with renewed purpose to go and tell. We love you today, Jesus. We love you today, Jesus. As we go, we go in your grace. We go in your power. 
we go in your purpose. Amen. Yeah.